My name is Feline Hermans of Leiden University in the Netherlands, and my ICER paper is about HEDI, a gradual programming language for programming education. And in this presentation, I'm going to explain to you, firstly, why we need a new programming language for programming education, and then how HEDI works and what we've done in the paper in terms of evaluation. So firstly, why do we need a new programming language? In order, to, in order to understand that, we have to go back in my personal history a little bit to 2013, when I started to teach children to program. There was a group of kids in a community center in Rotterdam in the Netherlands where I lived, and they needed a teacher of programming. And I had just graduated my PhD and I was like, sure, I can teach some children to program. How hard can it be? They're children. Because my, my PhD work wasn't about programming education at all. So at this point, I didn't really know what I was in for. But I, I tried it anyway. I was like, yes, this is cool. I will teach children to program. And then what happened sort of subconsciously is that I started to think back on how I learned programming when I was a kid. So when I was about 10 years old on my dad's computer at home, I taught myself programming. So there wasn't really a teacher to teach me programming. I mainly taught myself using books. For example, I had this book, Basic Computer Games. And this wasn't a book, if you're not familiar with teaching style of programming books in, in the 80s, this wasn't a book that really explained you how to do things. If you opened the book, it was just basic listing, printed out basic programs that I mindlessly copied into the computer because, you know, it said games on the front side and, and there was no internet where I lived at that time, so I couldn't download any games. So this was how I got games. And it was especially interesting, actually, because I didn't know any English. I was 10. I didn't know any English and it's not my first language. So I, I really had no clue what I was copying. But after a while, of course, you know, I, I did get some programming understanding from those books. This was also the way I taught the children. So I just gave them a bunch of books and I said, well, you know, just copy these programs. And programming education books nowadays for kids, they're a little bit better, but not that much. They're very much do this, do this, do this, and then you'll have a game. And the children were really struggling. And I didn't really know why they were struggling. I, I didn't understand because I was like, well, if you make a mistake, then the interpreter will tell you what you're doing wrong. And you can just simply copy the steps and then, then you will understand magically just from the activity of building programs. And this turned out just not to really work very well. And I thought, why is programming so hard? Th these are smart children that voluntarily come to the community center on Saturday to learn programming. They've all learned to read. Clearly, they're cognitively okay. How is it possible that programming doesn't get into their brains? And I think partly this is because I was part of the community of programming. And, and let's have a look at what our community says about what's hard about programming. Well, definitely it's not syntax. Syntax cannot be the thing that's hard. Here's a blog post. It's not about syntax. Language doesn't really matter. And if you look at forums like Reddit or Stack Overflow, people will say, ah, oh, you know, you can just Google syntax. There's the best part of programming is what someone says is you can look everything up on Google. If you don't understand the logic, it doesn't matter. You can just look up syntax. And, and I was also part of this community and part of this line of thinking. I was also like, well, if you don't remember what bracket to put where, you can, you can just look it up. And after a while, of course, I realized that maybe syntax matters more than I thought because I observed the children struggling with what bracket goes where. Is this a colon or a semicolon? This is the level that they were struggling at. And, and again, I didn't really understand because I was like, well, you can look it up or the interpreter will, will give an error message and then you will know what's going on. And just to, to reflect on how important syntax is. In the next slide, I'll show you a sentence in Greek. And of course, if you know Greek, this is going to be a little bit less fun, but I'm just randomly assuming that most people in the audience don't know Greek. If you have to reflect on this sentence, if I would just ask you, here, here's a Greek sentence, what would you reply to this? You don't know, right? You might not even know if Greek is a left to right or right to left language. So you might literally not know where to even start. And I think this is the situation that also the, the children in my programming club were suffering from. 
I gave them something so incomprehensible. The, the programming books had things in them that just were so much above their level that just saying, look it up, didn't help. If I would give you a Greek dictionary to figure this sentence out, do you know the alphabetic order of the Greek letters? Well, I don't. So you might not even be able to look something up because you don't know how the words will be ordered in the dictionary. And this is, I think, the level of confusion that the, the kids were at. This also creates sort of a, a tension in your brain. If you really try to figure out this sentence, if you would look everything up, it's really, really hard because you have to keep the letters and the words in your mind and everything you've already looked up. This, you might be aware of this concept, is called cognitive load. If your brain has to do a lot of things at the same time, if you extend the capacity of your mind, then you will experience cognitive load, which is what often learners are experiencing when programming. And as I said, I was quite interested in how ch children learn a natural language because a natural language also involves letters and words and sentences and some concepts like punctuation. Firstly, we say, well, here's the lowercase letters, just the normal letters, and you just practice writing sentences. And children practice, 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 practice. And they're like, okay, from now on, new rule, children. From now on, every sentence starts with an uppercase letter. And the kid's like, okay, new rule, practice, practice, practice. And then we say from now on, sentences end in a period. Okay, practice, practice, practice. And then the fact that we've learned the uppercase letters and periods unlocks a new skill because from now on, we can say, hey, from now on, sentences can span multiple lines because we have something to put in between. And this for, for seven year olds, it's, it is really quite mind blowing that sentences and lines are now separated as concepts because initially they're the same concept. This is how we manage cognitive load, adding syntactic elements step by step. So then let's look at programming education. How does programming education manage cognitive load? Well, here's a program that I threw at 10 year olds easily in Python. So this Python program just counts one, two, three, four. Actually, it counts 0, 1, 2, 3, because we're horrible people. But conceptually, this is something that a 10-year-old can understand, right? You just say, oh, this is just 1, 2, 3, 4. That's not hard. But then if you look at all the syntactic elements, it's like 4, I, in, range, open bracket, 4, closing bracket, colon, space, space in Python, print, open bracket, I, closing bracket. So we've already exceeded the nine elements that people typically say is really the absolute maximum of things that fit in your short term memory. This is just too much. Remember you reading the Greek sentence, it's just not fitting in your brain. The, the child's brain is overloaded. So then I was like, hmm, let's look at programming. And let's look at language. Hmm. Why do we give children everything from the beginning on. Why don't we say, hey, before you do a for loop, maybe you can just omit the colon at a, like a, a, an earlier stage. And then maybe before that, maybe we don't do next line. Maybe we don't do indentation. You just put everything in one line so you can get used to the concept. And maybe before that, we don't do for, which is not a very clear keyword. We just repeat four times. And of course, this first version where you have repeat four times print something, it is a little bit limited because now you cannot do one, two, three, four. You can do one, 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 but you can still practice repetition. And if you again compare that to language, initially children cannot make really, really long sentences because they won't fit on a line, but that's okay because they're learning. So this actually is the heady programming language. So just let me move over to my browser and just give you a sense of how the heady programming language looks like. So the first command we can do is print welcome to heady. And if we run the code, it appears on the right hand side. And here you see the, the magic of heady because we don't need any brackets. We don't need any quotation mark. We can just say print hello, welcome to heady. And it will print everything that's behind the keyword print. And this helps children just to get used to the idea of programming. What is programming? Well, it is typing something and then getting an output on, on another screen. That concept already is quite magical. 
then we can go to level two. And if we go to level two, then again, we can try code. And now we have variables. So we give, can give something a name and then use it as a variable. So here we say name is heady, just the word is, no equality. This will be introduced later. And then we can print welcome name. So if you run the code, now it says welcome heady. And, and if you know a programming language design a little bit, and you see we do some magic here, of course, behind the screen for kids, because welcome is a string, but name is a variable. But it's not up to the learner to decide that. We, on the back end, just translate variables into variables and strings into strings. We don't even need to introduce the concept here. And what I very much like about this is that we can now take learners with us in the need for syntax, because you've probably seen that th this creates a situation. Because if I want to say my name is name, if I would want to say my name is Hetty, it will say my Hetty is Hetty. So now I can take the learners with me. I can say, look, imagine a language that wouldn't have a distinction between variables and strings or between variables and, and raw text. That, that's a problem. And then we solve the problem in the next level because in level three, we add quotation marks. And now we've taken the learners with us and why this is needed because now I can say, hello, my name is Hattie, distinguished between name the string and name the variable. So Hattie builds up gradually and takes learners with it in that journey of why is syntax needed. So let me go back to my slides because the paper of course has lots more detail about the design principles, but it also has a brief evaluation. So we evaluated Hattie on almost 10,000 programs. I just wanna briefly point out what we found. So we found that 12% of Hattie programs have had an error in them, which is really quite low compared to other evaluations that have shown that Python or Java can have like 50% error rate even among good students. Of course, the Hattie programs were relatively small because initially it's not a full-fledged language, but we still think this is very um, hopeful. This gives us energy to continue this work. What we also found is that about 18 percent of the errors were wrong level errors. So this is definitely something we need to work on a bit where if students pick up something in level two, they might accidentally take it with them to level three. So that's something we want to improve because of course you have to adapt the rules and that's not something we are now commonly used to in programming education teaching. So that's what we want to focus on going forward. So if you want to have more information, I'm on Twitter at Felina. And my website is felina.com. And if you want to know more, of course, about Hattie specifically, you can just go to felina.com slash Hattie and all the information about the paper and the data set and the code is right there. We're open source, by the way. We're on GitHub as well. So if you want to contribute, for example, by translating Hattie to different languages, we now support Dutch, English, French, and Spanish. But if your language isn't there, we would really very much love for you to also translate the language into different natural languages. Thank you for watching my ICER talk.